there's something you will hear called the golden hour to actually get you or I or whoever else is critically injured into the hands of someone who can actually save your life. Knowing that you're going to be riding in this aircraft means that you're probably having the worst day of your life. The doctors are amazed that uh, I'm still alive. And what I put towards, too, is uh, the STARS crew. Too many people were losing their lives when they didn't need to. Code blue. All nurses. STARS Air Ambulance has been flying for 30 years, more than 30,000 missions. Their business is saving lives. This is their story. Blake Wilford is riding his motorcycle on Highway 93 from Calgary to Radium. It was August 19th, 2010, and I was traveling on my motorcycle to meet up with my wife. You know, I'm, I'm a very punctual person, and I said I would be there at 9 o'clock. I expect him at 9, so I thought if he said 9, it's going to be 10 to 9. So 9 o'clock came around. I had a drink ready for him. We were camping. I had chicken wings cooking, fire going, no Blake. I remember passing a lot of deer and thinking to myself when I passed where I normally see animals that, OK, that, that concern is behind me. I'm good now until I get there. So I wait till quarter to 10 and still no Blake. It was uh, around one of those turns coming down the windy highway into Radium that, uh, that collided square into a moose standing in the middle of the highway. So I went straight into the side of him, and the bike carried on. I just dropped straight on, on the highway beside him, and the, uh, and the bike went through the moose's legs and probably slid for about 40 feet down the highway. So I phoned home here, and my son answered the phone. And I said, Aiden, has Dad left? And Aiden said, what do you mean? Mom, Dad left at 10 to 6. There was a vehicle very close behind me. I was laying on the highway, and the moose was, was laying beside me. And they got out of their vehicle and walked toward me. And the moose got to his feet and, and walked off. I finally get a call, and it's 11.45 at night from my daughter. And she just said, Mom, Dad's been in a horrible accident. He's in critical condition. Um, you got to get to the hospital now. And all I remember is I hit the dirt. Like, I literally hit the dirt, and I was wailing. And these sounds that were coming from my voice, it's like I didn't recognize myself. I was just these wails. And, it, and what happened was I dropped the phone. I didn't realize the phone was still on. And Aiden heard all this. The kids heard me just saying, like, I was just beside myself. And I mean, social worker, right? Always in control, run the house, boss everybody around. And here's their mother, just a basket case. Blake's injuries are so severe, first responders call stars, and they're on their way in minutes. They started off in the ambulance with him and realized it was too significant. The brain bleeds and it, the lower part of his face was missing. It was kind of down in his throat. All his teeth were gone and he had broken collarbone and cracked, cracked ribs. Time is still very, very important. But more important than time today is that we're actually able to get very skilled hands to you. Getting the physician there or a highly trained nurse or paramedic to help diagnose or help the team in a remote area actually care for you. You know, STARS was so critical. It's been told me a few times that had I not been picked up by them with their expertise in dealing with my type of injury, the level of concussion, the brain bleeds I was experiencing, you know, having the right care, oxygen mix monitoring, that my outcome could have been far worse. All the way from radium to just outside of Banff, I think he's dead. Like, I'm convinced he's dead. Like, they're saying, you know, critical conditions, serious head injury. I'm thinking, he's gone. I woke up in a hospital bed at the Foothills Hospital in Calgary uh, early the next morning, my wife uh, standing beside me at the bed. 
I thought to myself, okay, he's alive. I don't care what condition he is. No arms, legs, like he's gonna be alive. This is great. It was a whole change of behavior from then on as to how I would look at our relationship, how I would appreciate our relationship and significant it is. And I'm very fortunate to have Amber in my life and have 35 wonderful years together and grateful that we have more to look forward to. I'm extremely thankful. You know, that's the, um, they, as far as I'm concerned, they saved my husband's life. Like, I don't know what our life would, would be. We wouldn't be sitting in this house. I wouldn't be sitting here. I don't know what would have happened to my kids. Um, I don't know what kind of condition Blake would have been in. Stars saved his life. They gave me a second chance. We go along in life and we uh, take things for granted and we do certain things without really thinking about consequences and that kind of stuff. And now everything means something to me. It's a life-changing experience. You see upright. <laughs> How are you doing? Thanks, you. I'm doing really well. Yeah. Every time I think about it, I just get shivers that yeah, I just don't feel like I would be here or in this condition or anything. Yeah. I don't know what my life would have been like after without you guys. came when an Alberta emergency doctor watched helicopter rescue in action in the Vietnam War. Five, uh, Roger, uh, uh, we, we've got you located. So I was in Saigon, on my way, kind of by accident, to do a flying doctor service elective in Australia. Uh, this is Bravo 5. Uh, we prefer to use smoke. We've got uh, quite a few down here with monitors on the way. I walked uh, to the nearest mass unit, and uh, the surgeons took me in very quickly. He saw what helicopter medical transport can do for patients. I mean, immediate transport, rapid intervention with surgical procedures, and life-saving procedures. Seeing the casualties in a very stricken way right, arrived in sophisticated care. So time and talent applied very quickly, and we were saving lives I never thought were possible to save. This soldier stepped on a Claymore mine. 16 minutes later, he was receiving care at a MASH hospital. It was just a combination of people with critical care talent and the time so shortened from the time of injury or medical illness to the time of treatment that was so impressive. And it obviously made a huge difference in outcomes to the patients. He saw how good the helicopter service was. And when he came back here, shortly, I think, after he became the head of emergency medicine at the Foothills Hospital, there was a, a young lady that they brought in by ground ambulance. And unfortunately, she didn't make it. Some 30 years ago, when I began work in emergency medicine, it just occurred to me that uh, a few too many people were losing their lives when they didn't need to. We leased an aircraft at the beginning but you have to pay the bills. Greg and Linda started this place, uh, one person at a time, very family atmosphere. We're relying on friends within the community to help us support STARS and keep it flying. We had funds coming in from bake sales. Lemonade stands. 4-H clubs. Cookie sales. Trail rides, golf tournaments. Selling baseball caps. People would line up loonies on a railing in a house and see how many loonies they could collect and then donate them to stars. Individuals just dropping by with $5 or five cents. It was just amazing the community support that evolved. Every single penny counted. It was a tough um, new initiative. I used to stop at the reception desk on the way in and say, did we have enough money for next week? And we started out with just the simple thought of leasing one helicopter and accruing it appropriately with well-trained people and sending doctors on the missions. And that crew eventually became the doctor, nurse, and paramedic, all trained in critical care and uh, emergency medicine. Everything was volunteer. You know, we had paramedics who would volunteer from the coffee rooms of the hospitals on their time off from their regular jobs. Um, eventually, nurses within the hospital, if they were free in between patients, they would 
jump on the helicopter and away they would go. I was sometimes the only doctor on call for a week at a time. The first time I went into real chaos in a small emergency department where a major traffic pileup had occurred and there was some people who didn't make it and some family members. People were just huddled in the middle of the room. No one knew what to do. The doctors were doing their very best, rural physicians, and uh, they were overwhelmed by the number of patients, as were the nurses. And seeing the sense of relief on their faces and what we could do to help change the outcome for those patients. That was one of the moments when I said, you know, we just have to keep doing this. This works. Stan Grad, a local rancher and oil man, was one of the key early supporters. Stan is a man of action and really wanted to help make a difference. So he did everything from fundraising to being on our board to actually help lead the organization in early, early days. He's an incredible man and he remains very, very involved and uh, has given us one of our largest personal gifts ever. Then the corporate support started to come on and certainly Shell Canada was one of the first corporate donors, which was really important at those days. Every single dollar counts, even today. And at that time, it was just critical to get through, sometimes to the next day or the next week. From the Lions Club, Shell and other oil companies, corporate support continues to keep stars flying. This year, CNRL stepped up with a donation. We've had unbelievable, gigantic corporate sponsors. Potash Corporation gave us $27 million. We've been unbelievably fortunate with who has stepped up. But the oil community in Calgary is where it all began. The memorable event that uh, most moved me was a dinner out in rural Alberta where they asked me to come out late on a Friday night and join them for a fundraising celebration called Hannah Helping Stars. And the epitome for me was a very small gesture on the part of a farmer who walked up to me and said, you know, Doc, out here in rural Alberta, when you have the big one, and he put his hand up over his heart, you most often don't make it. With you here, at least we've got a chance. We move the patient in and out through here. Pat Jeffrey is a nurse who has been with STARS almost from the very beginning. The first one was white, and it had a big uh, lion's decal on the side. And so we used that for quite a while as white. And then there's quite a story with the pilots about how it actually became red. Apparently, I think the end point was they got a killer deal on red aviation paint and uh, they took advantage of it and you really don't see red helicopters in the air. Although we like to tell the Saskatchewan base that it's, it's in uh, Stampeder colors and then they're always teasing us that they want to paint it green. <laughs> so the back of this aircraft, when I started, oh my God, like 26 years ago, it was pretty much empty. Um, there was a stretcher in the seats, but none of this existed. The roof mounts didn't. I mean, you have to remember that's almost 30 years ago. It was cutting edge medicine at that time. It's got a small interior and I can physically touch everything in my world that I'm responsible for. And I always say the ideal flight nurse would be four feet tall and have arms six feet long. That would be perfect. I'm right next to the patient and it also gives you a real opportunity to sometimes you hold their hands because they're scared. I mean, knowing that you're going to be riding in this aircraft means that you're probably having the worst day of your life and they're scared and often sometimes it's the little things that people remember. It's not, they don't come back and say, oh, I'm so happy that you, you shocked me and got my heart going or you straightened out my leg so it was the same length as the other one. They'll say, I don't remember much, but I can remember somebody held my hand. And it was, it's a comfort. It's the little things that people remember in a, in a disaster. Pat has spent more than half her life flying with stars. Her husband even proposed to her on a stars helicopter. My boyfriend at the time, he's a pilot here. We stopped at Foothills and he said, would you like to ride up front with me? And I thought, oh yeah, that's kind of neat. I don't, we don't get to do that very often. And just as we're flying back, he uh, 
He uh, reaches into his pocket and he pulls out a little box with a big blue ribbon on it and uh, handed it to me and there was this engagement ring. And I says, well, you know, you have to make it official. So I, he had to say, will you marry me? And I think the, the co-pilot he was with was kind of ticked off. He got kicked in the back, but then when he found out why, it was pretty exciting. And then we had another trip that night and I was just so excited. I was showing everybody my ring. <laughs> One, where is your emergency? On one mission, after she had already been dispatched, Pat learned that she was actually flying to rescue her own brother. This was a first for stars. The date is, uh, it's, it's, it's forever in my memory. It's January 2nd, 2010, about 2.30 in the afternoon. But um, I mean, it, it's, it's just one of those dates you'll never forget. My little brother had died unexpectedly um, on the 4th of November, and that was a huge shock to our family. And then our mother died on the 17th of December, and in fact, we couldn't even, it, it was very difficult for us to even tell her that Brian had died. We, we had to wait a day because we were just so distraught. And she was a very vibrant farm woman. She was out farming till till the bitter end, and, uh, and then, for Wayne, I mean, it was just like my family was getting smaller and smaller. And I remember meeting with Wayne on, on January 1st, and I was telling him, I says, you know, our family's gone through a lot. His son had died, passed away from cancer a year or so earlier, and he'd been through losing a brother, a mother, and, and a son. And I says, you know, 2010's gonna be a better year for us. And then the very next day, this happened. And I, honest to God, I just, I was like, like, this can't be happening. Like, this can't be happening. I kept thinking it couldn't get any worse. And I was wrong. I was like, you know something? I'm okay to go on this trip. It's like, you know, if at least that way I'll know that everything could have, that could have been done for him was done. And if, if he still passed away from that point, I, at least in my own heart, I, I would know that everything had been done. It was a surreal moment. We had um, got Wayne out of the bedroom and he was actually lying on the living room rug and we were putting a breathing tube in. And I remember I just kind of paused and looked up and my flight helmet was sitting on Wayne's couch. And everything just kind of stopped. I'm, I'm looking at this helmet and I'm going, Pat, your helmet should never be on Wayne's couch. It should be on a, on a stranger's couch or it should be in my locker, but it shouldn't be right there. And then it, that was like kind of like this little split second thing. Okay, you have to get back to reality now. Like, and so then I went right back and finished it. But it was just this weird fragment of time. Like, this, this is not where <laughs> I should be. We got him to Foothills Hospital, and yeah, I, I just broke down and cried. Like, this can't be happening. Like, I, how much worse can this be? I just, I was just sitting here two months ago. Thanks to Star's quick action. Pat's brother Wayne survived his medical emergency. Every time I drive to the farm now, I drive past the lawn where the helicopter sat down and I can still see it sitting there. You know, it's, um, it's, I, I don't wish it on anyone. I know exactly what family members feel like. And I know exactly when I was told that I probably couldn't come back from the flight. I know what family members feel like when I have to go up to them and say, Hun, you can't come with us. And I, I know how devastating that would be. And um, so, I mean, that just, I mean, I was, I thought it was pretty good before that, but now I, you know, I actually stand and look the mother in the eye and say, you know, I, you can't come with us even though I'm flying your son, but I'll treat him like he's my own. And I mean it, because I've been there. So you're going to be dispatched to an outbound scene call for a middle-aged lady. Uh, she's been complaining of chest pain for about 10 minutes, and she had a sudden collapse, which prompted a 911 call. 
STARS healthcare workers are constantly training to polish advanced skills through medical emergency simulations, often in a mobile education unit that travels across the three Prairie provinces. Golan provides just some complex medical and trauma scenarios for different practitioners. So it could be anything from first responders like fire departments, EMS services, or so paramedics, nurses, physicians, and just offers like a nice, safe environment where sometimes complex procedures that are not necessarily performed on a daily basis can be done in here on stand. Stand here, he talks, he breathes, his pupils respond to light, he responds to medications just like we would physiologically as well as to oxygen physiologically. So we always encourage people when they come through, talk to Stan. It's gonna provide them with some answers. We have a microphone in the ceiling here right above Stan. Typically, myself or one of my colleagues will operate Stan, which is solely that Mac computer. Our transport physician will have the headset on so they can hear everything from the mic that you saw on the ceiling. Oh, my leg, my leg, help me. Someone help my leg. So. That we can really reproduce things like the, just a typical patient response of so someone's in pain. So, team, just our priority right now is first on getting these stacks up. We've got stacks at 65, so perfect. We've got to... you know... Each one of these academy students will have done upwards to 20 to 30 simulation events before they start going on to their buddy shifts. All right, circuit breakers. Circuit breakers. Voice cut off. Guarded as well. Check. The constant training includes the pilots. One thing they practice is working with night vision goggles, essential in many rescue situations. We train and train and train. Nighttime was, uh, was a big concern. It was really difficult to operate at night. The goggles brought us a perspective of where we could see and what was happening. They've had a tremendous impact in terms of how we operate, especially into the mountainous regions at night. Before that, we couldn't. We just couldn't get there. In terms of risk, they're uh, invaluable. I don't know how we do without them. Rescue missions across Alberta and Saskatchewan are coordinated through the Emergency Link Center that aligns first responders with hospitals to provide life-saving health care as quickly as possible. Stars Emergency Link Center, this is Vanessa. Who am I speaking with? It's not unusual for the Emergency Link Center to be coordinating up to 20 or 30 people on any call for one patient. They're calling the hospital that's receiving the patient, RCMP or fire, paramedics, police. So there's many, many, many points of coordination. Edmonton police officer Bryce Clark's life changed forever in a freak accident at a backyard party. So August 26, 2001, I had invited a bunch of the, the guys and girls I work with uh, on White Ave uh, back to my place to celebrate the end of a successful summer. And we're having a couple of beers and a barbecue and sitting in the hot tub and, and in the swimming pool. And uh, I'd done something I'd done a thousand times, and that was I stood up on the railing of my deck and I dove in uh, to the swimming pool. This time, obviously, something went wrong, and uh, I hit either the bottom or the far side. I heard a big crack, and I thought, oh, crap, something's wrong. And I couldn't move. Uh, right immediately, I couldn't move, and I could hear all my buddies uh, up on the deck. They thought I was uh, joking around. And so they're laughing and teehing and yelling, Clark, get up, come on, quit screwing around. And uh, I, um, uh, that's the last thing I remember. He's not moving from, you know, probably the shoulders down. And that's what we know going in. We know get the patient stabilized, do the interventions that you need to do, and get to the city. My place was a big acreage, so STARS was able to land right in the front yard. And uh, they whisked me away from, from there and, and flew me to the University of Alberta Hospital. was told that uh, I'll never work again, never walk again, uh, be reliant on somebody for the rest of my life. I'd wanted to be a police officer uh, ever since I was a little kid. My dad was a police officer in Calgary. 
you know, be faced with the reality that I may not be able to continue living that dream uh, was, was absolutely devastating. In the summer of 2003 is when uh, we really started to look at me coming back to work. I was fortunate enough they asked me to come and, and see what I could do with the gang unit here at Edmondson Police Service. To see him come back and tell us 12 or 13 years later, and he's now a police officer working in the homicide division in Edmonton, doing an amazing job, doing some undercover work. This was a good thing. You may not have felt like that at the time, and it's been a long road for your recovery, but you are a valued member of society, and we are so appreciative that we got to meet you, to help you with your life, and that you could use it um, for your benefit and the benefit of others. I'm just one of a countless number of people that STARS has helped and uh, that they continue to help every day. You know, there's many uh, success stories like me because of STARS. Once STARS was established in Calgary and Edmonton, the next logical step was to serve remote areas in the north with a new base in Grand Prairie. So Mark, we'll think about after you get them on the monitor, we will start an IV. From a nursing perspective, my whole career has been in a hospital. So to come to STARS and be able to do scene calls, first responder, that kind of stuff, like that is so, so neat being a nurse to be able to be in the ditch helping someone as opposed, or in the back of an ambulance as opposed to being in a hospital. Access is difficult. Uh, I've done a mission here where we're 20 minutes on scene for a, a gentleman who was a query heart attack out at a, at a lease site. And it would have been a four and a half hour drive during spring breakup, uh, just with all the weird river crossings and industrial roads in the back country. We did an industry call for a quad rollover and uh, we had to have heavy equipment moved in to protect us from a grizzly bear that was stalking us while we were packaging the patient. So that was a little intense. Shane and Drover was one of the first rescued after a horrific car crash on an icy highway an hour north of the city. I was driving from Fairview to Grand Prairie. It was minus 45 out, and my car was hit head on. I just remember seeing the car go towards the ditch, um, and then it corrected itself, and I just remember it coming straight towards me. And I didn't really have time to think, I didn't have time to react. I just, everything just paused, and I just remember seeing this car, and it just slowly crept towards me. I went into the ditch. I broke bones in my right foot and my right leg. I crushed my left foot. Um, my bones in my left leg were broken. Um, I had an open book um, fracture on my pelvis, so basically broken in half. And then my left arm, I uh, broke bones in my left arm, my forearm, elbow, everything like that. It was quite painful. I could feel my pelvis and my legs. It felt like my feet were trapped in the engine, basically. It was excruciating. I just remember screaming and screaming, somebody help, somebody help, I'm trapped, somebody help. I just remember screaming and screaming. And then this guy just walked towards the passenger side and he's like, I have 911, they're on their way, it's okay. And I was able to finally like calm down a little bit and know like, okay, help is coming. Stars was quick to arrive and flew passengers from the other car to hospital while a Stars crew member stayed with Shaylin, who was still trapped in her vehicle. It took two hours for the EMS crew and the fire department to cut me out. They were finally able to stabilize me and they put me into the STARS helicopter and they flew me to the Grand Prairie Hospital. I remember going into the helicopter and I remember them saying seven minutes. So I had seven minutes to get to the hospital. I was in the hospital for four months. Um, I had to kind of learn to walk again, learn to use my arm again. But yeah, my parents were right by my side. My brothers were there. Um, I had family flown in from Grand Prairie come down, and I had family come up from Newfoundland. It was, it was, it was an emotional day. <laughs> Shaylin's injuries were incredibly destructive and painful, but what hurt the most was the loss of her best friend, a chihuahua named Anakin. I kept asking, where's Anakin, where's Anakin, where's my dog, but nobody would tell me. Um, I thought he was still just with me. Um, I didn't actually know that he had died in the accident. 
He was my first dog that I actually trained and never did everything with. He went everywhere with me. Um, he used to go into stores, come to work with me, everything like that. So, yeah, he was he was my world. He was only a year and a half when he died. So, yeah, I will take all the pain and everything, but he's like the thing that actually hurts me the most. I met with the flight crew after I got out of the hospital. I was so, so happy to actually go and meet them. Um, they were super thrilled, I guess, to finally meet me and see me walking and be able to move around and stuff. We shook hands at the beginning, but by the end of it, we were hugging and taking photos with each other. Just a great group of people that I'm forever thankful for. STARS is more valuable in northern Alberta because of all the rural areas around and the remote areas. A lot of places that like an ambulance couldn't get to, um, and to be able to take a helicopter and go out to any of those open areas, like if there was an ATV accident or anything like that, they need to be able to go out into these open fields to be able to pick people up, and they're extremely, extremely important up in those areas. STARS has expanded operations into Saskatchewan and Manitoba, now covering territory from the BC interior to the Ontario border. This wasn't STARS going out and saying, we want more business. <laughs> this was uh, two governments saying, we think that there's something missing in our emergency response planning. And would you consider expanding into our provinces? One of the really great pieces about being a medical practitioner in Regina is, is you kind of know everyone. And I think there is a culture to Regina where people just kind of go, well, let's just get it done. That seems like a great idea. And you don't spend a lot of time stuck in meetings and bureaucracies. It's just, it's a good idea. Well, let's go ahead and do it. It was the Manitoba flood of 2009 that started to show what STARS could do. Ambulances weren't able to go to certain places, you know, transport patients back to Winnipeg. I remember actually packing up the helicopter with a bunch of supplies. We had a van going out with a bunch of supplies and just seeing the helicopter lift off, knowing that it was going out for that specific purpose, you know, it gave you tingles. Dave Evans flew on one of STAR's most memorable missions, rescuing and reviving a young boy who had drowned in a culvert. We responded, amazing work by first responders, amazing work by family members to, uh, you know, initiate CPR. We were able to quickly provide, you know, advanced resuscitation, get them into the helicopter quickly and, and start our journey into Winnipeg. The amazing story is nobody gave up on, uh, on this child. Um, we got him into Winnipeg Health Sciences, amazing care occurred, you know, at the hospital. You know, and all of a sudden, two days later, we're getting news back that, you know, he's starting to uh, awaken. He's starting to move all his limbs. He's starting to talk. He's asking for the red helicopter. And that young boy, in any other circumstance, would not have survived. He's one of our poster children. Still comes out and visits the base. There was a few missions that happened during the course of that deployment that showed the need to bring patients from the rural communities in a quick manner, you know, into Winnipeg. The result's been awesome. We have great relationships. We've obviously impacted several lives. There's a helipad being built at Health Sciences in Winnipeg, which will improve our times to get patients into definitive care. So the impact's been tremendous. Just listen for the nice scratch as you go back all the way to yourself. Right. Oh, there you go. Done. Also in Manitoba, when Steve Lipischek faced almost certain death from a head injury, STARS was there. My accident happened outside of Winnipeg, what we call Zeke's Corner. It's about an hour and 20 minutes out of Winnipeg. It was fall, it was September 13th, 2013. I was gonna change some decorative lighting around. Foolishly enough, it was at the top of the ladder, which I shouldn't have been. I'm reaching over. fell on some concrete pads, fell on the back of the head and had a head trauma. And as far as in my memory, that's where it stopped. Opened the door and my husband was lying on concrete pads. There was a, a severe head injury. I could see the blood going all over the place. Oh, this is hard. Um, he was bleeding very bad, and I went down, and I 
cuddled him and he was conscious only f for a few moments and then he died in my arms. Um, that was the end of my life then, even if it was only for a few moments. I didn't know what to do in those few seconds. All I did was scream and holler uh, why this happened, prayed to God, I did everything. Neighbors came over because they heard me. They got dialed 911, and I knew how to do CPR, so they instructed me to do CPR. So I did CPR for a good 20 minutes to keep him going. I think that without her doing CPR that he wouldn't be up and walking today. My wife saved my life primarily by providing CPR for me, keep me going. They actually had to pull me off, Stephen. I didn't realize that. I was so focused on doing CPR. And the ground crews did keep him going for a while, but then he kept going in and out of consciousness, and he wasn't going to make a ground trip of an hour and a half. So they called in stars. From the time that I fell to the time that uh, I was in the hospital, it was under an hour and a half. And through discussions with other doctors and so on, they're amazed that uh, I'm still alive. And what I put towards, too, is uh, the STARS crew. For me, it really didn't hurt me. It hurt the people that cared about me more than anything else. It's just a feeling I cannot put words to. I'm a little bit maybe too protective of him. You know, when I see a ladder, maybe not going up on no more ladders. Stephen and his wife came after, and it was quite emotional for everyone there. They came and just thanked us for helping them out that day and told us how much that, that meant to them, and that meant a lot to us too, because often we don't get to meet people or hear their stories afterwards, and it's always really nice when you get to do that. We made efforts to meet with the ground crew and thank them very much for, this, for their help. Uh, basically a big hug and thank you. He came in and he was just extra appreciative and it just makes you feel that much better about providing the care and doing the job that we do. That's what we try to tell other people that have been helped. Go see your crew, talk to them because they need to see from a situation where you're in a bad accident to where you can walk or at least be in a wheelchair and talk to people. I just gave him one hell of a big hug. That's all I did. I just hugged and hung on and just, just thanked them so much that they were there. One of Starr's most dramatic rescues took place after a near fatal accident on a construction site in Saskatchewan. I was working in construction and we were building a wall. I went to get materials like a saw and a board. And then as I was walking back, I forgot about the staircase hole and fell through in, into the basement and then when I was laying there, I was trying to move my one arm, but it wouldn't move. And then I tried to call for help, but I didn't have a voice at all. And my boss came and checked up on me and poked me everywhere to see if I could feel it. And I could hear him say, oh my God. I got a phone call from Kurt's boss. My heart just went into my throat. I was basically panicking, but trying not to and trying to retain information. And I said, like, is he going to die? And he was like, I'm not sure. So then I felt like I had to be at the site. I wanted to check it out for myself. I fell onto uh, a piling, and there was rebar sticking straight up. And the rebar went through my armpit behind my left ear and it shattered two of my vertebrae. We didn't know any details of what happened. We just knew that we needed to make an attempt to get there as soon as possible. They lifted me out of the basement window. I just saw a lot of emergency crew working with him. My sister showed up and talked to me for a little bit. Being a nurse, I have a medical background. Um, I knew it was serious. Uh, the fact that he couldn't feel anything, he couldn't move anything other than his left leg, I was very scared for him. I finally got to talk to him and I asked him how his day was. He said I was terrible. So. He still had a little bit of sense of humor. Um, so I was glad to know he was awake and alert and recognized me and he was still Kurt. 
and then they phoned Stars to come and pick me up. We always tend to prepare for the worst, so you kind of start mentally preparing for like bleeding and airway problems and things like that. They flew me to Regina Base. STARS was really important because we knew it would be a smooth ride. Sometimes the highways can have some bumps and stuff, and, and just having that rebar move at all could um, have endangered him. We knew it would be professionals on board, um, and that they would take care with every little movement to save and preserve his life. There is a lot of tension where the rebar actually sat. There was a lot of potential for things to go wrong. We land, and from there, um, I stay with the patient and monitor his vital signs and make sure that he, you know, he remains sedated and not moving. You could see the rebar in his body, but he was able to converse with us at that time. Um, so, like, he asked us to take pictures of him, and uh, um, then they also asked us to leave the room because they had to um, take the burrs off the end of the uh, rebar, and so. So we had to wait out in the hallway while they did that. The scary part was waiting for surgery and waiting to see if he would even make it through surgery. They weren't even sure that he would walk initially, but I guess the surgery went, went really well and he had four surgeons involved. I was in uh, the hospital for about 100 days and I was just starting to be able to stand up in hospital. December 24th, um, he actually took his first steps with the support of his therapist, and so that was like one of those priceless Christmas gifts we had. We're very proud of him. I'm thankful for every person who, who made his life possible because um, the skill of, and expertise, right, from the EMTs and firefighters to STARS to um, every person who worked in the hospital. It's very impressive what they do here. They're very, very talented. Each person doing their job the best they can has brought him forward. Words can express how much it means to us. Thank you. For us, it's a pretty incredible experience. Uh, to be able to meet somebody or someone's family that you've been personally that closely involved with is a privilege and, uh, and at times very overwhelming. So I think that the families and individuals feel like they are saying thank you and we so appreciate that. But I think our lived experience in Side Stars is those are some of our very, very best moments. I feel so fortunate to have been part of something where the people all around the province have picked up the process of saying, yes, this works and this counts and we're willing to support it. And it's just so rewarding to walk down the street and have someone stop me and say, you know, how many helicopters do we have now? Not how many do you have. The community owns a part of this, and, and they're proud of it. And to see that inflected in people's eyes is, is a wonderful experience.